Welcome to Michigan Rocks. My name is Rob. On this channel, I'll take you on rock hunting trips around Michigan. We'll visit beaches, waterfalls, quarries, and old mines. I'll show you Petoskey stones, pudding stones, fossils, and even an occasional agate. I'll also teach you how to tumble and polish rocks as well as other lapidary techniques such as cutting rocks and making jewelry. I'll be adding new videos every week or two so be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new content. I'm not sure what the black matrix rock is but it smells like oil when you cut it. So this one I've got cut. So you can see the uh, ends of the coral here. And this part doesn't have quite as much but uh, here's another one. It's been uh, more polished. I don't think this was in the tumbler. I think I polished this by hand, but I, I don't remember for sure. Uh, but that's a really cool rock. And as long as I'm showing you that, uh, here's a pendant I made for my wife out of that, that same rock. So kind of cool. Then uh, there, there's all kinds of rocks you find in Michigan, but I'm just showing you some of my favorites. Uh, this is a banded rhyolite that I find up in the Keweenaw Peninsula on a very, very remote beach. And when you tumble it up, that's the, the same kind of rock there. Uh, it looks like that. It's good, good shine on it. Uh, this is one of my most exciting rocks I found just this spring um, here in Alpena. Uh, this is banded iron formation, or sometimes it's called jaspalite. So the, the red is jasper. Uh, this is jasper, this red here also. And then the, the grayish or the darker parts is uh, hematite, which is uh, iron ore. But you find this, uh, there's a place up in, in Ishpeming called Jasper Knob where there's a whole mountain made out of this stuff right in the middle of the city. It's really cool if you're ever up that way. Um, you can just walk up a short little trail and, and the top of the mountain is just a huge exposed rock made out of this stuff but I've never found it here in Alpena before, and this is a really nice sample of it. So it's kind of excited to find that. Um, of course, we have fossils galore here in Alpena. This is chain coral. Um, so it looks kind of like little, little chains there. Hopefully the video looks good enough that you can see that. And uh, this stuff's cool because if you put it in acid, if you use um, muriatic acid and soak it in, or put water and then a little bit of acid in the water, uh, you can do this to it. So all the matrix rock wears away and you're left with just the chain coral. So um, that's a pretty cool fossil. I, this one I ground down flat on the back and then I put some polyurethane in the back so the acid wouldn't eat the back of it. So I'd have a little base to set it on. Very fragile. The first time I did one of these, um, I was holding it very gently uh, to go show my wife I was very excited about it and I dropped it on the kitchen floor and it broke into about a million little pieces and uh, there wasn't even enough to pick up. It was just I swept it up and threw it away. So anyhow, this was a little uh, better results this time. Uh, Rob, just, Rob, just to let you know, your video is coming through fine, the close-ups and everything. Great. I'm glad to hear that. Um, this is some of my Toski stones, uh, my favorite ones uh, that have been polished. Um, so. Uh, this one I was putting in some new lights and I dropped a screwdriver on it. So it's got a little white speck. I got to sand out one of these days, but that's a, that's a really nice rock. That one I hand sanded. Uh, I didn't do the back of it. Uh, so uh, that was all done with sandpaper and took about uh, probably about an hour uh, to do the whole thing. And uh, I, I'll brag a little bit. I won the uh, worldwide rock tumbling contest in 2016. I think in 2017, I got second place. Uh, 2018, I didn't place at all, and this year I decided not to do it. Uh, but anyhow, um, this is a lapidary club in uh, California, I think. It's in California, uh, the Feather River Lapidary Club, um, and they put on this contest every year. There's not a lot of people in it, but it's just kind of fun to win something. So uh, here's some other fossils from the area. Uh, if you're interested in fossils, you live in the right spot. 
Uh, hold on, hold this lid down. All right, so these are uh, just uh, various fossils. This is a crino crinoid stem. If you go to Partridge Point, these things are all over the beach there. Um, you can find some at Rockport. There's there's different places you can find them. It looks sort of like a bolt, but it's a it's a sea animal uh, that looks like a plant, kind of looks like a flower growing up out of the ocean floor. And on the top, it has it looks like a, a flower kind of thing on the top. I don't have very many of these heads, but they're kind of hard to find. Um, kind of cool. Then uh, we have brachiopods here, which are like a little seashell. Um, these just amaze me how, how uh, delicate they are. Like those little tips there look so fragile, but uh, they've made it for like 350 million years intact. So that's always kind of fun to find them. Uh, a good place to look for these is Burke Holder Drive. Right across from SciTech Park, there's a ditch. And uh, as soon as you turn uh, onto that Burkholder Drive, go in that ditch and you can just pick up all kinds of little stuff, little tiny fossils there. There's a little bigger, different kind of brachiopod. And I'm not a fossil expert. I'm not even a rock identification expert. I just think they're fun and cool, so. Um, I don't know if the detail is going to show up on that one, but that's got little tiny speckles all over, super little thin thing. Uh, and I can't remember the name of this stuff right now, but it's got a name. Uh, here's some uh, coral fossils. Lots of corals around here. Um, Toski stone is a coral, by the way. This one kind of has a variety of stuff going on it. Um, you can find these big snail shells. Uh, one place you can find rocks, if you ever find a place where there's uh, big limestone chunks put uh, to like block roads and stuff, uh, look on top of those, especially after the winter when you have the freeze and thaw cycles and you can find some pretty cool stuff. Um, Bob, just, just, just a comment came in that if people yep. want to see your, uh, your video or your, what, what we're seeing here in a larger view, this is for the participants. If, depending on the device, you can generally go to the, if you're on a computer, you can go to the top left corner, top right corner and enter a full screen view and you'll get the full, a little bit larger image than you normally do. Thanks, Chris. Back to you. Okay, thanks. Um, here's a couple other little coral, little branching corals. Uh, what do we have in here? Some, uh, these are crinoid discs. And let's see if I can get that to focus. So you'll find these little tiny things. Sometimes they have holes in them, uh, but that's just what these are like all stacked up. So sometimes you'll find an individual little disc that makes up one of these bigger ones. So yeah, I grab one here, kind of small. That one's from Rockport because at Rockport they look like little gears sometimes uh, where they got these little teeth around them. My daughter made a, a necklace out of these once. She strung them together and, and made, or a bracelet I think, and made a bracelet out of it when she was little. Uh, this is a blastoid. This is from Partridge Point. I found this last spring. Uh, there's smaller ones and I can never I keep forgetting to bring my glasses and then I can't see them, but I found this big one. Um, I bring the neighbor, uh, my next door neighbor is into looking for fossils. So I brought him with me and he come home with handfuls of them and I can't find any because, because I forgot my glasses at home. So I found this one though. So I came home with the biggest one. So that's called a blastoid. Um, some sort of a, it, I think it's related to a starfish. You can see it's got five uh, segments to it. So that's kind of a, kind of a cool fossil. Um, so when I make, uh, I, I make different stuff, which I'll show you here in a second, but one of the first things I do is slice up the rocks on a saw and I have four different saws, which I'll, I'll show you three of them. Uh, but this is a piece of Petoskey stone that I, I sliced. So that was where the first slice came off and, uh, then the back of it. And that takes about maybe a rock this big probably takes, and I went this way across the rock, probably took about 45 minutes, um, half an hour to 45 minutes to cut one slice across there. Uh, but it's the kind of thing where you can put it in the saw and then you walk away and it's got a, an automatic shut off. So you can just check it every once in a while and put a new rock in and slide it over. 
Um, this is that cladopora again, and I've got to get these wet for you. This is the rock like I showed you here and here. Um, this is a, another one sliced up. Show you that Chosky stone wet, they look a lot better wet. And that's what it'll look like polished up. So if you look at it wet, you kind of get an idea of what it's going to look like when you polish it. Uh, I make little stone crosses here. Uh, and this is, this is uh, some unikite. Uh, it's a rock that I pick up in Lake Superior, although we have it here. There's, there's a lot more of it in Lake Superior, but I do find it here quite often also. So um, unikite is the pink rock or the red rock is epidote, um, or I'm sorry, feldspar, and their green rock is epidote. Um, so if you put those two minerals together, um, and there's some quartz in there sometimes, but it's called unikite. So I, I uh, mark those out and I cut them out and they go in the tumbler and they get nice and shiny like, uh, like this. So uh, there, this one's unikite. And you can if I show you the light, you can see it shiny. It's shiny. So I, I sell these at um, Olivet and uh, I give them to uh, my priest who gives them to people sometimes also. Um, so cool little crosses just carry in your pocket or something. This is a piece of white quartz I found here in Alpena. Actually, this is from Alpena. Not sure where that is. These two are probably from Lake Superior. But uh, this is super white quartz. I really like this one. Uh, this is another rock I found uh, earlier this spring in Alpena. I don't know what it is, uh, but I thought it was really cool looking. Uh, so I've got it sliced up um, or partially sliced. I got the other half you have to slice. I'll show you how I do that later. And Rob, is that, Rob, is that quartz in that rock or what? what? No idea. Uh, it's not like, quartz though. It's, okay. it's very soft. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure if this will, uh, I couldn't tumble this. I might be able to polish it up other ways, uh, but it's not quartz. It's, it's, uh, it's quite soft, whatever it is. Huh. So. Uh, then this is, uh, this is the pudding stone, uh, what you get when you slice this stuff up. All right, uh, any questions before I go on? Yes, this is Bob Disher. Uh, I have a Potosky stone that we picked up out of the quarry a number of years ago. It's uh, it's about the size of a football uh, with uh, pieces knocked out of it. It's it's you have one sitting right there underneath the uh, uh, right the, yeah right there. Um, we I think we have two of them in our garden that we picked up from the um, um, from the quarry when we toured it a years ago. So what can we polish it with? Hand polish it. Um, it, is the, if it's a quarry rock, you see how this one's kind of got yes. bumps over it? Yeah. Uh, this is from the lake, uh, and I'm not sure how good this will be, uh, but quarry rock tends not to um, polish up, at least the quarry rock here. I've heard in lake, uh, over by Lake Michigan in the quarries, it's, it's, it's okay quality out of the quarries. Uh, but I've gotten, I polished a big one out of Lafarge, about as big as you're talking about. It was all washed out and kind of didn't look very good. Um, then I, uh, I got them out of Rockport and, uh, they tend to be kind of black colored there and they don't polish up very well either. So I would suggest getting, um, getting a rock from the beach and look around until you find one, um, look for the, see the little white lines in between the hexagons there? Yeah. Look yeah. for one with, with very well-defined lines and it's yeah. going to look a lot better. Um, Hold oh, on a second. Over on over on Torch Lake, there's a <clears throat> there's a beach over there that have little mini <clears throat> Petoskey stones about the size of dimes uh, that we've picked up. Um, it, there's a beach over there what? just north of um, someplace. I forgot. Our well, kid, okay. kid used to live over there. Wow. Hold on, trying to pick up a box of rocks here. With there you go. <laughs> yeah. There you. Yeah. Okay. Just, I have a video about how to tell a good Toski stone from a bad Toski stone, and I show rough and, and polished examples. Uh, but some are going to be like like that one. Yes. It's nice and well defined, but we find one that's not so good. I try not to polish the ones that aren't as good, but well, there's an example. Mm -hmm. 
that's just not nearly as good. So you want to, before you hand sand one, you want to go look for a good rock um, because it's going to take you a while to do it. Um, so I have a video on how to do the whole thing on my YouTube channel. Oh. Uh, but you start with, use automotive wet dry sandpaper. Hold on a sec. So you get this stuff. Um, it's a silicon carbide, uh, 3M makes it, other places make it, but go to an automotive store and get like a variety pack of this. And you start with maybe 80 grit or 60 grit, and then you work your way to finer and finer sandpaper. So you should end up with something around uh, like 3000 grit. And uh, then the last step is kind of tough. The last step you need to have something called aluminum oxide or ZAM. So this is ZAM and it's, uh, I put it on with a Dremel tool. Uh, so I just dip that in the ZAM. It's, it's like a hard waxy stuff. It's not actually a wax, it's got abrasive in it. But the last step where you really get the good polish, you either use this or it's a white powder called aluminum oxide. And for the aluminum oxide, I use, here's a, just an old piece of uh, denim from a pair of blue jeans. And then you put this powder on there and you get a little wet, and you just rub it on there. Uh, but you need to get some aluminum oxide. So um, if, uh, if anybody want, really wants to do this, stop by my house sometime and I'll give you a little aluminum oxide and then you can make tools. So, um, out of, Rob, out of curiosity, where do you get the aluminum oxide from? You order it online or something? Yep, uh, there's a place that I order most of my stuff from called the Rock Shed. So it's therockshed.com. You got to get the thought in there. <laughs> so therockshed.com. And uh, they sell tumblers, uh, really good prices. Um, everything there is, is good, well, well priced, and uh, they have good service. Stuff ships right away. Uh, that's where I get most of my stuff. I also buy some of my grits from a place called Kingsley North that's up in the UP, um, Norway, Michigan. And uh, that, that place is okay too, but um, I like the Rock Shed the best and then Kingsley North for my core grit because they'll sell it to me in 45 pound bags um, and, and then the price is better. So I do get my core grit there, but um, most of the other stuff comes from the Rock Shed. Thanks. We did have one question early on about have you, have you uh, cut petrified rocks? Uh, yeah, I've tumbled them. I don't know if I've cut them. Cut petrified wood, you mean? Yeah. I assume that's what you mean. I have a whole box full of petrified wood. Um, okay, this is one of the problems here is if, I, if you want to see something, I've got cabinets that are full of uh, rocks, and sometimes they're shoved into the back. So, um, But yes, I, I've, uh, I, don't, I don't think I've cut it, but I've tumbled it. Hey, Rob? Yes. Um, I've got like five or six big pieces I brought back from North Dakota. When I worked out there, it pops right up out of the ground. So when I say big, I'm talking, you know, two foot across by three foot long. And some of them are pretty unique. You can see the knots. And so someday if I'm in town, I'll grab a smaller one and bring it by. It's, it's a dark brown. It's even very shiny the way it came out of the ground. So it's, I haven't cut any. Actually, this, I just remembered, the, the rock tumbling contest, the year I won it, it was petrified wood from Arizona, which is the more yes. colorful stuff. But that's petrified wood right there. This whole trophy is made out of it. So you can see the kind of the outside of the tree there, and then it's been cut and polished here. Sure, cool. Any other questions right now? All right. I will move on. If you have questions, interrupt me. Uh, so these are some of the things that I make um, from the rocks. Showed you the crosses. Uh, I also cut out other shapes. Um, this green just looked like it should be a shamrock, so I made a shamrock out of it. Uh, this is like a refrigerator magnet. I just glue a magnet on the back of it. Um, this is a rock called Kona Dolomite that comes from Marquette. Uh, you know how we have like limestone we put in ditches for erosion control? They use this beautiful pink rock up there, um, like we use limestone. Here's a, here's a piece I polished. Um, the, the desirable stuff is this pink uh, part. 
and you'll get some quartz in it. And then you get kind of these, um, I don't know what color you call that, but less pink uh, color there. But that shows you kind of layers. This is uh, called stromatolite. It's the oldest living thing on earth. It's like a sort of like an algae from what I understand. So this would have laid down in the bottom of a, an ocean or something. Um, you can see how there's layers in it and then uh, fossilized. So that's from our cat conodolomite. And uh, I've made uh, like this is a conodolomite. I thought it kind of looked like a, a maple leaf. Um, not quite the right color, but that's what I made out of it. Uh, I make Michigan uh, shapes. These, these are all magnets. This is the very first one I ever made, which I, I sell these at uh, the local basket case carries them sometimes. I don't think they have any right now, but um, I, I won't sell my first one. Um, a little deer head I made. Rob, yeah. how do you cut those in such an intricate shape? This machine right here, this saw, um, this is a, um, so you put water down in the bottom here to cool the blade, and then it's got a diamond blade. And so uh, one of the things you gotta be careful of when you cut these shapes out, this is a really nice saw because the blade comes out of the saw at a 90 degree angle. Um, I'll do a little math here. So you can see the arbor is at the same level as the tabletop. So you're hitting this, where this comes up, it comes up at a 90 degree angle. If you've got any woodworkers watching, you'll know that if you try to cut like a notch into a, into a piece of wood like this. Here, I've got an example here, because I use one of my videos. Okay, so here's one that's cut on a different saw that doesn't have the, the blade, where the table's up higher on the blade. So if the table was up like there, where I'm holding this rock, you can see the blade would cut deeper on the bottom part than on the top. So if you're not careful, you get that little where it cuts deeper on the bottom than on the top. So it looks great on the top, and then you turn it over and you get it cut too far. So anyhow, this deer head was cut right here on this saw. And uh, what I do is I use the edge of the blade as kind of a grinder. So I'll, I'll get in here and just sort of work it around. Um, these blades don't cut so much as they grind away. You can put your finger right on the blade when it's running. Um, on my YouTube channel, every time I do a video with the saw, my fingers get really close to the blade. People always send me messages and say, you're, you're, you're gonna cut your fingers off. And I've, I've just touched the finger or my finger on it while it's running before and, and nothing happens. Um, so it's a very safe saw to work with. And you gotta be careful not to get tangled up in the belt or something, but other than that, it's pretty safe. So it's not a, a scroll saw or a jigsaw or a band saw. Um, all these shapes are cut right on there. So I have another trim saw over here. Or kind of, I don't know if you'll see this, it's a little darker. So if you notice, see how that blade, uh, the arbor is below the table and the blade cuts at an angle here. So this cuts in deeper than up here. So um, if you have a saw like this, what I, I've done is made a ramp for it. So this, I had this saw before the other one. So hold on. It's hard to do stuff with one hand. Okay, that's kind of stuck. But anyhow, the, the ramp goes on there. Um, it's not down all the way, but when it does go down all the way, then the, I can run the rock down here and it hits that, uh, makes that 90 degree angle. And then you can, you can use this saw like the other one. All right, back over here. Um, so uh, a couple little bears. Uh, I make guitar picks. So my hands are all grungy from touching that saw, but um, the guitar picks are just, I cut a real thin uh, slab of rock and then I cut them out. Here's some that are partially cut, partially done. Um, I cut them out and then I, I grind the edge so it uh, goes to a taper. And then I throw these in the tumbler, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, and then I make some pendants. So you want to see it? Oh, go ahead. Pardon me? You sell those guitar picks at. What do you sell the guitar picks at? All of that. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then the, the pendants. Um, 
These are called groove wrap pendants. So they have the silver wire that goes around a little groove around the outside. And I, I really only do those. I know people do more fancy wire wrapping where the wire's all over the place. Uh, these are easier. And uh, I kind of like them because they don't, they don't cover up the rock. Um, the rock's the main star of the show in that jewelry instead of, uh, instead of having wire all over the place. This is another one I made. Um, I had my wife said, "Oh, make a triangle." And I don't think she ever wears it, <laughs> but that one actually has a, drill, a drilled hole through it, and then a piece of wire in it. Uh, then a, a lot of the stuff that I make for my wife uh, are these. These are called Magnabilities necklaces. They were popular. I don't know if they still are, um, but Magnabilities, and they have these little buttons that go in them. So this is one she bought. It says Wildcat Pride. So you can put these little little magnetic buttons in them, but I didn't like those. So I made her, you know, like putting stones and so this, this just snaps in there. And uh, here's one that's Tosky stone. And then there's just a bunch of other buttons I've made for her. That's Kona dolomite and that's Kona dolomite, like the, the big rock I showed you over here. That's that kind of rock. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't know what the, this, I don't know what that one is. Um, this one I found Alpina had cool little spots, didn't shine up as well. This is banded iron. That's the same as this rock um, from a different source. So it's a little different. Uh, this is unikite. That's just granite. Um, not sure what these are. These are unikite. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly unikite, but it's got epidote in it. And I'm not sure what that one is, but these all just have a magnet on the back and she can snap them into her, her little necklace there. Uh, then I make these little turtles. Uh, this is like a design I came up with on my own. I was kind of proud of it. Um, the local basket case carries these sometimes. Um, they take a long time to make, so they end up selling them for, um, I think they sell them for 20 or a little over $20. I sell them to them for $15. Um, even at fifteen dollars, it's kind of a lot of work for fifteen bucks. So you have to make, I have to make uh, like basically one of these for the top part, and then I've got to cut out the bottom part on this saw, like I was showing you with the other ones, and then glue them together. Uh, but that turtle shape is actually harder to cut out than than like the Michigan shape is. So you know, there's Tosky stone, which is the best one to make a turtle shell out of. And then I just like mixing up, making some other ones. So there's some of that uh, Cladopora. And uh, this is some sort of quartz or quartzite that I found here in Alpina that I thought was really pretty. So, um, and actually that bottom part is a green quartz that I found locally also. Um, usually I make the bottoms out of a unikite or just any green rock I can find. And then uh, I uh, made her some beads for a Pandora bracelet. So, these are uh, also cut out on the saw. I cut the circles on the saw uh, and then uh, just drill a hole through them. Or I start with a hole and then I cut the circles actually. Here's a couple other ones. That's unikite on the, or yeah, you, um, sorry. Um, conodolomite on the left and epidote on the right. And then they go on the Pandora bracelets. So I also got some Cladophora there and she's got it mixed with uh, epidote. So those are types of things that I make. I really like cutting out the shapes. That's probably my favorite thing to do. Um, the pendants, I don't actually like doing the wire work and stuff. So um, she would like to have more pendants than I make for her, but um, she's got a few. <laughs> so um, any questions before I show you a few tools? Yeah, uh, Rob, uh, this bill. Uh, two questions, Rob. Will you pick up any stones that have like copper in them, like copper, copper, copper in them? And then number two, will you use like a diamond drill to drill the beads? That didn't come through very clearly. I didn't hear anything. Oh. Uh, can you pick that up now? Yes, that's much better. Okay, uh, the first question is, do you pick up any stones that have copper, like from Copper Harbor area? And then two, do you use a diamond drill to drill the holes in the rock? Uh, yes, uh, to all the questions, or both questions. Um, I don't have any copper that I, 
right here right now, but I have picked up rock that has copper throughout it. Um, I've got a few little copper nuggets I've picked up also. Um, I don't have a metal detector, so finding copper is a little harder. I do have one that I, hold on. I'm gonna set the phone down and grab a rock, okay? Because <laughs> it's back kind of buried. So give me just a second, I'll be right back. All right, in one of these boxes, I have our copper rock that I found on the beach up. Do you know where the jam pot is? Where the, uh, the monks sell the fudge and stuff? I picked up that rock on the beach and there's a piece of copper sticking right out of the end of it. Um, but I've also looked at the mine piles. There's copper all throughout this rock. I've also gone to the mine piles and uh, picked up copper stuff there also. Um, and then how do I drill the holes? A uh, couple ways. If I'm doing, I don't know if you know, if anybody knows John and Rita Wilberg. Um, Rita was a teacher and John worked at the hospital and the, uh, doing the, the food for people. Uh, anyhow, he, he, he hires me once in a while to cut uh, make beads out of pudding stones. So he makes a lot of pudding stone jewelry. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I cut little one millimeter holes using this Dremel on a, on a little drill press here. This, this is a bigger bit, but I use a uh, little one millimeter um, bits. And he'll give me like a couple hundred little chips of pudding stone. And I'll drill holes through all of them and then tumble them and I send them back to him. And he's got all these little beads and then Rita makes uh, jewelry out of them. Um, this is just a Ryobi drill press um, that I use. And this, for the, for these, I use this core drill. So I drill it out and that's the, you know, that's like the scrap, I guess, from the hole that comes out of the middle of it. So that's a diamond uh, drill bit there. That's a really slow procedure. Unless you're doing Kona Dolomite or Petoskey Stone, which are both really soft, um, that goes pretty quickly. But something like that, that pudding stone, that probably took a half an hour to drill through the thing with me pumping the drill up and down. You kind of have to do it in water and pump it up and down. Um, so it takes a while. So anyhow, that, that drill bit goes in there. And then I just have a little tub of water that the rock goes in because you need to keep it cool uh, or else you'll ruin your drill bit in a hurry. So those are the, those are the two drills I use. Any other questions? Yes, at what speed would you be using that uh, drill press? Uh, slow. <laughs> okay, thank you. Whatever speed that is. <laughs> okay. um, if you go too fast, you'll burn out the bits faster. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm doing everything exactly right. I'm, uh, I'm kind of self-taught for a lot of this stuff. There's a, a website um, called Rock Tumbling Hobby. That it does. They, they talk about rock tumbling there, but they talk about other lapidary arts also. So uh, that's where I've learned most of my stuff. And there's people there are really helpful and telling you what to do. But um, I've not had a lot of people demonstrate stuff for me firsthand. So um, I'm just getting it from discussions online and figuring it out as I go. So a uh, couple other tools. I showed you my little saw here. Uh, I have another saw up here, kind of in storage. Uh, that was my first little saw, but that one doesn't cut those 90 degree angles like this other one does. Uh, I showed you the saw over there, and I'm going to take you to the garage here real quick. And I'll show you my, it's actually not a bigger saw. I think all of my saws have 10 inch blades. But this is a uh, slab saw. So this is the one where I can just put the rock in, and I flip a little switch and there's a, there's a chain here. So as this thing, there's a motor in this box. Um, when you turn it on, this whole carriage moves slowly towards the blade, the blades, the blades right there. This is a big Toski stone. Um, I've got the Toski stone glued onto a two by four because I, this is the one that I cut those slabs I showed you off of. So I cut two or three slices off of here 
and then I glued this to a two by four. And then you can clamp the two by four in there and I can cut the rest of the rock. So I'll take the rest of the slabs. That last one will be a little crooked and probably get broken up and go in the tumbler after that. Um, but there's oil in this saw, uh, keeps everything cooler, um, lubricates everything. So I can just start this one and walk away and come back a little while later. And as that, as that carriage goes back, it pulls the chain and turns the switch off here. Uh, so it just sort of takes care of itself. Um, Nice. The only bad thing about this, every time you move the rock, every half an hour or so throughout the day, um, you have to wash the oil off your hands. So other than that, it kind of takes care of itself. So that's called a slab saw. We'll go back to the basement. And then the, the smaller ones down in the basement here are called trim saws um, for the cutting of the, the shape of the cabochon or whatever. These are called cabochons. This, you know, these different shapes, you make them whatever shape you want. So uh, let's see, that's the saws. Um, let's go back over here. I showed you the groove wrap uh, pendants. So these rocks have a groove in the side and then that wire goes in the groove and you don't really see it from the front. So for that, I use this machine this is a, uh, this people that do stained glass use machines like this. So it's like a router table. Uh, this spins around. And if you're doing stained glass, you just have a little, you know, a shaft with diamonds on the side of it. And uh, I, I guess shape your glass. I've never done the stained glass. The only bit I have for this is this little groove bit. So this part down here is a little grinding blade. And then I just push the rock up against it. Here's a rock. I push the rock up against it like, like that and it cuts a groove in it and I just move, move around like this. Um, this little thing's called a dop pot, D-O-P, and it's to melt wax. So this, it's not on right now, but um, this just heats up the wax and then you can put a stick on the back of your rock so you can work them on the next machine that I'll show you. So over here we have, uh, this is called a cabbing machine. So it's for making cabochons and people just call them cabs for short. So this wheel's kind of worn out, but anyhow, it's got, it's got different coarseness of wheels. So this is, I forget if it's like 80 grit or 60 grit, but that's a coarse wheel. Um, that's a little finer. And then as they go down the line, they just get finer and finer and finer. So this is 3000 grit down here. Um, so you just keep taking scratches out as you go down the line until you get a polished little rock. Um, so that's a cab machine. The other way you can do this is by using this. This is called a flat lap, and I'm pretty sure this is homemade. Um, it, it looks like some sort of a bucket or something here. So I bought this, I bought almost all my equipment used except for the rock tumblers. But what this does is it spins this around when you turn it on. Uh, this is just to drain water out. Uh, it didn't come with this part, so I, I hooked this up, uh, made this myself. This is just a um, piece of PVC pipe and I put a little uh, little valve on it there on the side and it drips water onto here to keep it cool. So this spins around like a record player and you rub your rock on the top there. So you can make those cabochons on here. Uh, I've got a stack of discs that I just change the discs um, from one to the next and get finer and finer. So this does the same thing that machine does, uh, but this machine is, is much nicer to use. Um, so cabbing machine and a flat lap over here. And then we got the tumblers. Uh, so this is the first tumbler I, I've ever bought. Um, still works fine. I've just replaced it with this whole cabinet as a tumbler, which I'll show you in a sec. Uh, but this just rolls around. You, you fill your thing with uh, rocks. You put some grit in there. So grit is, let me show you the grit. Grit is like really hard sand. It's a silicon carbide. So this is 120, 220 silicon carbide. So that's the, uh, it's like sandpaper. It comes in different grits. And this is a range of sizes from 120 grit to 220. And it just looks like sand, uh, but it's, uh, it's very hard and when it breaks, the little pieces break into other sharp little pieces uh, and keep grinding. So um, put the grid in and uh, just go through different stages uh, 
finer and finer grits until they're all polished up. So that's a that's called a rotary tumbler. This is a excuse me, Rob. Is that reusable after it's after it's uh, you you tumble the rock? No, um, it it will break down. So I change my grit once a week. Uh, I'll dump it into a colander over a bucket. You don't want to put the stuff down your drain because it'll clog up your drain because it turns into like concrete with all the rock dust in there. Um, so the the grit. That's why I buy 45 pounds at a time. Uh, and I use, in a little barrel like this, I use three tablespoons per week. So each week, I'll open the thing up, dump the rocks out, rinse them off, and I go through and pick out any rocks that are ready to move on to the next stage. So like all little holes and cracks and stuff are gone. Um, and that can take a really long time. Uh, actually, here's my, I was doing a video. Um, and these are the weeks, I think I, I end up with 17 weeks um, of tumbling just in the first stage for some rocks I was doing. Um, and then they got to go for another month after that if I'm using this kind of a tumbler. I got another tumbler that can do the last stages in a, in a week instead of a month, but um, that course stage just takes forever. So uh, no, the, the grit, uh, like I said, it breaks down as it's tumbling those silicon carbide pieces break into smaller pieces, but the smaller pieces still have sharp edges on them. But by the time you get to the end of the week, that 120, 220 grit might be like 400 grit. Uh, it'll be such small pieces that it really is ineffective at grinding the first stage anymore. Theoretically, you could just let it keep grinding for, just put the grit in there and just leave it there for a, a month rolling, and it would get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. They'd eventually shine the rocks, I guess. Uh, but you wouldn't get rid of all the little holes that way. So uh, the only grit that I've heard people reuse is the polish grit because it's already really small and you want it really small. But the tumbler that I use, um, I don't use this tumbler for my end stuff. So with my tumbler, um, I use a half a teaspoon of, of polish. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's like $5 a pound. So a half a teaspoon um, each time I do a batch of rocks, I, I, that'll last, you know, if I buy a pound of this stuff, it's going to last me a really long time. So there's no need for me to reuse that and the other stuff you can't reuse. So that's probably the biggest expense between the grit and electricity to run the tumblers. Those are the biggest expenses in, uh, in tumbling. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So here's, here's my, uh, big homemade tumbler. Uh, I've got the motor up on top to keep it cool. Uh, so you don't want to put that inside of a cabinet and this little one doesn't make too much noise but I have um, I have a base like this that runs these bigger barrels and these bigger barrels being bigger diameter the rocks fall more uh, or farther and they they kind of makes a thumping sound and you can hear it upstairs and my wife put up with that for several years and kind of complained once in a while and so I told her if I made this big cabinet I could tumble more rocks and it'd be quieter and at first it kind of made a hum, kind of like a washing machine or a dryer, kind of a hum, but you could hear the hum upstairs. So I ended up thickening up the sides and I bought this special stuff to, to deaden the sound and it's really pretty quiet now. Um, you can slightly hear it upstairs if, there's, you know, if it's really quiet. Um, but anyhow, here, I'll flip it on for you. So they just run like that. Um, well, for the last eight years, they've been running like that. But if you shut the doors, it's a lot quieter. So that's my big, big rotary tumbler. Um, it's really weird being down here without it running, because usually when I come in the basement, that's just always going. I don't, I never turn it off. I just. I turn it off. I don't turn it off even to take the barrels off. They just, you know, I come off, I empty them out and throw them right back on and the other ones keep rolling. So um, I've had tumblers literally running since 2012 um, down here in the basement. They just go all the time. Uh, so people always want to know how long it takes. Um, rocks take as long as they're going to take. So if um, some one rock might take two or three weeks in this stage, and uh, another rock might be in the barrel for, for months. Uh, like I said, the last, this last batch I did took 17 weeks um, it, just in this stage. And that was 17 weeks to get enough rocks out to fill another barrel, to fill a barrel like this size up again. 
um, to, to go on to the next stage. Um, but they didn't all get done at the same time. Each week I take out a few rocks and the, all the rest of the rocks go back in and then I throw some more rocks in with them. And uh, the whole thing just keeps rolling, rolling, rolling uh, indefinitely. Uh, and just rocks come out as they're ready to come out. And then the other tumbler I have, this is under the stairs, which keeps it quiet. So there's stairs that go up. Let me give you the lay of the land here. There are stairs that go up to my garage here. And then this is a little cabinet space underneath. And this is my lotto tumbler. Uh, this is a vibratory tumbler. This can be kind of loud. Um, so I'm going to turn this on and show you what it does. So that has uh, has some agates in it right now, uh, but that tumbler can get stuff done in instead of doing a week or two in each stage. This only takes like a couple of days in each stage. So in a week, I can do um, I do two twenty grit. 500 grit and then polish um, so three stages and it takes me a week total to do it instead of on, on a rotary tumbler like over here this would take me a month to do the same thing um, at least a month um, so that that other one's really fast it also uses almost no grit um, and it doesn't use as much electricity just because it's not running as long so uh, I, I really like that other little tumbler so this is called a rotary tumbler because it, it rotates and the other one's called a vibratory tumbler because it just vibrates that barrel. Uh, let me show you again what it does. So the way this works, it's attached to a concrete block. Uh, there's little springs here. So this, this is springy. And then this has little weights inside these little, uh, the motors underneath here. And these little fans have a weight inside them. So when that spins around, it shakes the whole thing. Um, and that makes them move around and tumble in there. So I, I, that's, a, that's a great little machine. Love that machine. And then uh, if you watch my YouTube videos, uh, this cabinet I built just to store rocks in. So that's my tumbled rocks that someday I need to start doing like craft shows or something and get rid of some of these, but I just haven't had time. Um, so maybe when I retire, I'll sell some of these, but this is on wheels and I wheel it over to that spot on the floor. You can see it's marked in my very messed up floor from all the water on it. And then I use a GoPro camera here on a tripod. And at the same time, I've got this, uh, this camera up here going. So I stand with the table here, uh, the tables in this area, and then I can demonstrate things. And that one that's farther away actually is zoomed in to get close-ups. And then this one gets kind of the wide angle shot. And this is also the same camera I use when I'm on the beach. I've got a little handle that, that you can attach to it and I can just carry it around like that. It's waterproof. I got to take this off, the microphone off to make it waterproof, but then I can, uh, I can go underwater with it or whatever I want. So it's called a GoPro. So that's kind of my YouTube setup. Okay, time for more questions. Ram, how do you get to your YouTubes? Uh, it's just go to YouTube and type in Michigan Rocks. That's the name of my channel. Okay, thanks. Yep. And, and the, the videos there, I have a variety of things. I've got videos where I'm on the beach looking for rocks. Uh, or Well, you saw a little intro. Um, so a lot of them are people really like watching me look for rocks. I, I, Honestly, I don't know why people like my YouTube channel because it's either me walking on the beach looking for rocks, so people that can't do that, um, or sometimes I have older people that, that used to do that and they can't get out anymore, uh, so they kind of live vicariously through my little rock hunts. Uh, but I've got those kind of videos. Um, I'll go to sinkholes and other things like that, go to Rockport, um, uh, and then I, I've been to a couple waterfalls. Uh, but then I have videos down here where, like, I have a video where I showed how to make the turtles. And I have a video where I showed how to make the little hearts. I don't know if I ever showed you this one. I make these little heart pendants. 
Um, there's a video on that. There's a video on how to make these. There's a video I made uh, the, the deer heads. So pretty much everything you see here, there's a video of the exact procedure I go through to make them. Um, so, and then the other little series of videos, I uh, kept having people ask, um, what do I do with all my tumbled rocks? So I made a video, what do you do with all those tumbled rocks? And I showed my big cabinet of rocks and people were very interested in seeing what was in all the boxes of rocks. So I've got a series out every Tuesday night, it's called um, Rocks in a Box. And I just simply dump out a, pile, a box of rocks and I go through them and show people what's in them. And those aren't as popular, but the people who like them seem to really like them. I forgot to show you my tumbled rocks, by the way. Uh. Carnelians, little tiny things. Those were kind of a pain because I had to like check each one of these little rocks in the tumbler, so it took a long time. Sorry, my fingers are all dirty, but that's what happens when you start playing with saws. Um, so, little carnelians. These are Apache tears, which is a type of um, uh, obsidian. So that's basically volcanic glass, um, so naturally formed glass by volcanoes. I always think these two look like jelly beans. I'm afraid to put them out on display in a table upstairs because some little kid will <laughs> pop one into their mouth and break their teeth off. But, um, but kind of fun little box of rocks. Um, and then I had a video about tumbling this stuff. This is called Mexican Crazy Lace Agate. None, none of these I've shown you right here are from Michigan. These are from, well, this is from Mexico. Um, but this is just a, a beautiful, beautiful rock. Um, really, really pretty stuff. Uh, there's one in here that's this one. This one is kind of unique. It's got all these little eyes or orbs on it. Those are gorgeous. Yeah, they are gorgeous. This one's got a little, uh, they call that a vug. There's a little hole in it, or a, a druzy vug in this case. A druzy means it's got little crystals. And vug means it's a hole in it, so got that cool hole in it. But just really pretty rocks. So there's a video. It's like a 45-minute long video showing my whole procedure how to do it. So the video got a little bit long, but it's, it was meant for people who are trying to do this themselves. So it wasn't meant to be an entertaining video. It was meant to show you how to get the job done. Uh, but people like just watching it for fun, I guess. But like. Anyhow, my box of rocks videos are doing basically what I just showed you there. Like, make a box of rocks and I just show them off. And uh, it's fun watching the comments on YouTube. You know, people are oohing and on over stuff. Uh, these are called Botswana agates. From Botswana, obviously. But uh, really cool agates. They look a lot like Lake Superior agates, except the colors are a little different. They tend to be more browns and grays. So, Rob, you talked yep. about um, tumbling something until it was done. How can you tell when it's done? What's your criteria? Uh, let me show you. So let me just grab, I'm digging around in my cupboards here. Okay, these are done with the first stage. So this rock is completely smooth. Actually, that probably should have been tumbled out right there. Um, but I try to get rid of as many cracks as I can. And there's a point, actually, I'm going to tumble the rest of that out. That's going back in. Um, but that crack, I won't be able to get rid of um, without a lot of effort. I mean, it's going to take another couple months to get rid of that. But I try to tumble them so they're completely smooth. So they're not shiny yet. Um, but they're smooth and all little, all little holes are gone. So I'm starting with rocks that look like, just grab a rock here. Um, all right, so if I'm doing beach rocks, it might look like this and it's got, can you see the cracks there? Those cracks I don't want in there. Uh, these are actually pretty smooth. See how that one's got those, those dents in it kind of? I'll tumble it until those are gone. Um, so there's kind of a hole in it. I'll just tumble, tumble, tumble until those aren't there anymore. Um, but some of the rocks that I tumble, we have got to find a good example for you. Uh, oh, here's the petrified wood. 
I guess it was right in front. Um, we're just looking at petrified wood now for a second because I got distracted. Um, some of these just look like like an old piece of wood you'd pick up on the on the floor in the woods somewhere. This one you can actually see the the rings a little bit. Anyhow, so if I was going to tumble this, which I, I probably won't, because I think the, the beauty of petrified wood is that it looks like wood. So if you tumble, it doesn't really look like that anymore. But, um, you know, if it starts out as a, a rough, broken rock like that, that's going to take a lot of tumbling to get it all to be smooth. So I would get all these little holes and stuff out until it's completely smooth. So does that answer your question by what done means? Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, so yeah, just uh, these are these are going to go in that lotto tumbler. When when I get this filled up, um, it'll take about that many rocks in that tumbler. So when that gets full, um, they'll go to the next stage. But yeah, the idea is I don't want any any holes in the rocks anymore um, or cracks if I can get rid of them. Hey Rob. Yep. Hey, have you ever heard that there's gold in pudding stone that when you cut them, have you ever seen any evidence of that? I've seen those articles. Um, in, in, or, I, I don't know. There, there probably is, uh, but I've never seen gold in it. Um, I've, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really looking for gold. There'd be such a small amount that it's not worth it, but I've heard gold. There was an article somewhere that said gold and diamonds. Um, I suppose... This is called a conglomerate stone. So these would be rocks that fell into like a river or something. And then the, the mud or whatever in the river turns, you know, it all just sort of solidifies into this. I'm not sure the exact process, but it's, it's a sedimentary stone. Um, and and this, this type's called conglomerate. So I suppose if some gold was in that river uh, and it hardened in there with the rest of it, sure, there could be gold there. I think that's where that comes from. Uh, but no, I've never found any gold in any of them. Nothing that looked like gold to me, at least. Okay, um, I found some gold. Uh, up in the UP on the beaches, there's black sand. And that black sand, I've panned it. And uh, I found actually a whole lot of gold. You can almost see it in here. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the little specks in there. Um, but there's a lot of pieces of gold. It's just... Uh, it's so small that it doesn't amount to anything. So uh, I brought black sand home from, from Lake Superior and panned it here in my driveway, which embarrasses my wife because I'm sitting out in the driveway panning gold. And I guess that's embarrassing. But um, so, yeah, I've heard that too, but no, I haven't actually found any. Rob, my wife and I were walking the beach and with a, a, a man and uh, he was, he picked up something out of a pile of stone. And I says, what are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for glass. And it was, a, an, a, I had no idea how to go about doing it. Uh, and he had a trained eye as to what he was really looking for. So there's, there's a real secret to that. And I think uh, that might be something that uh, you, you may want to entertain with, you know, what to look for. Uh, for any particular rock that you might be looking for. And thanks for what you're doing. Sure. Oh, yes. Uh, here's some beach glass. Uh, I don't really care for beach glass. Um, I pick it up just because it's litter and my sister uses it. So this, <laughs> this piece is done, I guess. And this one, you know, looks like a Mountain Dew bottle or something, or maybe a beer bottle. Uh, but it's, it's still pretty rough around the edges. I mean, it's still shiny. So the good stuff you want to look like that. Um, I don't look for it. I find it once in a while, but I actually don't find that much of it. Um, as to, for what to look for, uh, pudding stones just jump out at you. You, you yeah. can't really miss it. That red is so red, uh, especially when it's in the water and wet. Um, it just, it just kind of glows in the water. So that's easy to find. Um, Petoskey stones are easy to find, uh, for me at least. And they, they just have that pattern on them and they, they pretty much stick right out. Uh, agates, I have, I have a, a box of agates in here somewhere. Um, these are, 
these are the rocks that I, I think might, some of these are agates and some are, I call them maggots because they, they may be agates. Um, but these are harder to find for me. So try to get that to focus there. Uh, those have bands on them. Uh, the key to finding these, this is not polished. This was just like this on the beach. It was already tumbled. So I've heard lots of different people say lots of different things. Um, they say not to look at individual rocks, but to scan the beach. Let me get my water here. To kind of scan and just look for stuff that looks different. Uh, one lady told me she looks for white um, on the rocks. So, mm -hmm. so th these are from Lake Superior, um, and they are very hard to find. I went once, uh, I went camping for two nights, and over the three days I was rock hunting, it was like the day I got there, the full next day, and the following day that I had to drive home. Um, and this was between Grand Marais and Whitefish Point is where I usually go. Uh, and I, I spent 20 hours on the beach. I kept track, and I had... I mean, all the rocks, I, the agates I found could fit in my hand like that. They weren't even all necessarily agates. So they're really, really hard to find. Um, but I don't know. Like that's definitely an agate. So on these, one of the techniques you use, some people will look in the water where it's wet, but everything looks good in the water when it's wet. Um, other people say you should only look on the on the dry ground because... Most of the rocks look dull, but these kind of have a little bit of a glow to them. They're translucent, and so the light, I don't know if you can see that, probably not. The light shines through them, though. Uh, so if you can go, like, like, in the evening or in the morning and walk into the sun, if the sun shines through from the other side of the rock, it'll make them glow. And I only had that work for me once. I was on this very remote beach up in the Keweenaw Peninsula, and I found all these little, like, they weren't banded, but they were little carnelians, I guess you'd call them, like that box of rocks I showed you. So these tended not to be banded, and they were just little guys, but they looked like Christmas lights on the beach that, that evening. Um, they were just, it was just, they were obvious where they were. They were literally glowing. Um, so that's one technique. Like I said, if you walk in the, in the uh, dry rocks and you look for them, you look for that glow. Uh, if you're in the water, just look for something really bright. Let me show you this one. This one is kind of a mess. I can't cut it or tumble it or anything. And I, I don't tumble my own Lake Superior agates. They're just too hard to find. Uh, but I posted this on a Facebook group called, uh, I think it's just called Lake Superior Agate Collectors. And they told, I, I wasn't sure if it was an agate. Uh, and they said, oh, it's absolutely an agate. Um, but it's really, really pitted. But that thing was so much brighter than every rock in the water that was in the water. Um, this was at the mouth of the Two-Hearted River. I found this one. Um, but that just really stuck out. So uh, it takes a little more training to do that. Uh, you look for waxiness. Um, you, you look for red. You look for, see how that's broken right there? That's called a conchoidal fracture, which is kind of like a seashell-shaped fracture in it. Um, glass will break the same way. It gets like little seashell shapes in it. So you look for that. Um, but yeah, those are harder to look for. But other rocks, um, like Toski stones, I, those are just stick right out at me. I don't know. Um, I don't think those take a lot of skill to find. Other questions? Well, Rob, it looks like we could have spent lots of time looking at your YouTube channel, too. So there's a wealth of yeah. information there. I figure people can look at that on their own if they want to see more. Um, right. Hey, Rob. I had a Jasper conglomerate about the size, about, about the size of a football. And I took it over to the uh, community center over in uh, Rochester, Michigan. And I, I took the curator and I showed him this rock. He says, come on with me. And he took me back in their garden area there, and there was one there about, about three foot in diameter. He said, "Now that's a that's a jasper conglomerate." So <laughs> it kind of made mine look like uh, look like something that you would wear around your neck. But this thing here, you could you'd need a bulldozer to move it around. So 
But thank you. That was uh, quite interesting. In fact, not quite as very interesting. I'm glad we spent the time with you, and thank you for for doing this for our all group and for the rest of the 20 some or 30 some people who uh, were entertained with this tonight. You're, you're welcome. Um, when you say Jasper conglomerate, do you mean like pudding stone, like I showed you? Yes. Yeah, it had the Jasper in it. We yeah. we have a we have one about uh, probably three or four times that size. <laughs> Uh, right outside our door here. Uh, the Jasper is the red? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, I polished, uh, there's a guy from uh, Hubbard Lake, um, not, not originally from Hubbard Lake, but they have a cottage there. Um, and they brought me one about football size, maybe a little smaller, last summer and asked me to polish it up. I have a, I didn't show you that tool, but I've got a Makita um, stone polisher. It's like a, it's like an angle grinder, but you, it, water goes through it. Uh, so that you, it's for countertops. If we're doing uh, concrete countertops or stone countertops, so they brought me this uh, this rock and asked me to polish it for them. So uh, of course I was charging them to do this, but polished the rock and they were thrilled with it. And it's really I don't like doing that because it's I'm standing out in my backyard uh, getting soap and uh, it yeah. takes a really long time and it probably annoys the neighbors. Nobody's complained, but I try not to do it too much because it's loud. Um, so then like a week or two later, they came back with, uh, this rock was like 110 pounds, um, putting stone <laughs> Jasper conglomerate. And they asked me to do that one. So, um, I did that one. It took me 10 and a half hours to, to polish it up, but that's, that now lives in Colorado. They took it away with them. But, um, uh, there's a, a video on my channel, uh, with a pudding stone. They're, pudding stones get really big. Um, if you're going by, if you go out 32, if you go about, about the middle of the state on M32, there's a church that's Big Rock Church. Uh, if yes. you stop there, that the Big Rock that I, apparently they worship um, is a pudding stone. So uh, I don't. It's a really nice pudding stone too. Not not quite worth worshiping, but uh, it's a very very nice pudding stone. Yeah, we'll so. we'll stop there the next because we go to that part of the state rather frequently. So we'll we'll stop and take a look at it. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a really nice one. I found one about that size um, in the in the water. In fact, um, I've been in, there's a couple radio stations that did websites about me. And uh, one was this winter, I guess, um, this radio station from I don't know where. They had a, a story and the, the guy, he didn't ask me, and I'm sure they didn't ask me, but went to my YouTube channel and took some screenshots and did this story about and said that I might have found the biggest pudding stone in the state um, or the biggest pudding stone ever. And it, that's just a ridiculous claim. It was big, but there's lots of big pudding stones. So it was underwater. I got a video. And uh, so then the Detroit News or Free Press called me and they wanted to do a story about how then. then OK, so after that, I went on, on Facebook and there were like thousands and thousands and thousands of people that saw this article through Facebook. So the free press wanted to do a story more on uh, how, how things go kind of viral on Facebook and what I thought about that, what I thought about this article about me. So um, anyhow, that was, that was about this big pudding stone I found in the water. But yeah, the one in the water was probably four feet across and uh, is a really nice one too. In fact, hey Dick, you've got, that's the video I, I gave you. You want to pop that on just at about the the, the the second the second video. Yeah, and then just go okay. to the, go to eight yeah. minutes on it, and you can see that rock. But it's the second link that you sent me. Yes. Okay, hang on. Okay. Rob, while he's doing that, do you ever decorate your gardens with your stones? Oh yeah, like actually. I've had many um, hobbies over the years. Uh, so I, I'm a juggler, um, big thing for a while. And then I was into gardening for a while. I actually like rock garden. So I don't have polished rocks out in the garden, but I have a lot of rocks in my yard. I made a, a um, fire pit um, with a pad uh, on a way stone and a little stone wall, boulders in my garden. There's a video on YouTube. <laughs> Okay. If you want to have rocks in my yard, uh, right. there's a couple of videos. Or you guys are local, drive by and I'll give you a tour of my yard. Okay. <laughs>
110 Kensington Court, just past the junior high. So if, if, seriously, if anybody wants to look at my rocks in my yard, if you're into gardening, I'm kind of into gardening too. That's the video. Skip ahead to uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes? Yep. This is the big pudding stone. That'll do. Wow. Really big and really cool. And That's my foot on it. After I take the kayak to shore and show you the whole thing. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm a long ways past civilization. But it's just beautiful out here, and it's worth every minute of paddling that it took to right. you just rock. I'm going to go to shore, and I'll be back in a minute. This is only about waist-deep water next to it here. Let's go underneath and take a look at it, though. I wonder how long that would take to polish. <laughs> That'd be all summer. Do it by hand. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> would you be allowed to take that out of the water? No. Um, I suppose there's a 25 pounds a year limit on picking up rocks in Michigan. That's a little over 25 pounds. I tried to get it in the kayak, but <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it didn't fit. That's probably enough of that. You're back. Yep, I see me. Um, any other questions? I don't have a question, Rob, but th uh, this is Jeanette. I just wanted to thank you. I just really enjoyed your hobby. Thanks. I, this was fun to do. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I was asked. <laughs> Any questions about uh, my YouTube channel? Has actually done quite well. I, I'll tell you a little bit about that. I guess um, last. So I, I've had a YouTube. Um, account for a long time and just put uh, you know home videos and stuff on it and then uh, my daughter had she used to raise butterflies in the basement here she'd uh, had like cardboard box with some screen over the front of it or something and she had all these butterflies uh, monarchs uh, chrysalises and she was into it but I, I was you know it was kind of interesting but I never saw one hatch so one day she said hey dad one's gonna it looks like some are gonna hatch or come out whatever they're called and so uh, I grabbed my iPad and uh, went downstairs here and uh, did a little video of these chrysalises coming, you know, opening up, the butterflies coming out. And I just posted that on, on, on YouTube. I didn't know what else to do with it. Um, and I looked like a couple of years later, and I hadn't really noticed, and it had like 100,000 views, uh, like all these people would watch it. And I thought, wow, maybe you could uh, actually do something with this YouTube thing. So... Uh, last winter we had all these snow days we had 19 snow days last winter so i polished a, a toski stone by hand at that time and uh, i was just bored out of my mind after like five days of sitting in the house kind of like now um anyhow <laughs> i started polishing this rock and made a video and I, I was trying to make a video to um to you know make a little money on youtube or something so uh at the same time i had a video where i was walking on the beach and i made this video with an iPad held over the water. Um, and I, I it, was just, it was made for this rock tumbling hobby website. Um, I was trying to show the people the difference between a good Toski stone and a bad Toski stone. So I'm walking down the beach, picking up Toski stones and going, oh, here's a good one and saying why it's good. Or here's a bad one and I'd toss it into the water if it was a bad one. Um, so when I decided to kind of get serious about YouTube, I thought, uh, well, let's go back to that. And I had a picture of, I was wearing a camouflage neoprene glove 
with a nondescript rock in my hand was kind of the random uh, like teaser photo that, uh, that YouTube put on there. So I thought, oh, we can find a better picture than that. So I found this really nice pudding stone uh, sitting on the beach. It was just a part of my video and did a little screenshot. And I made that the, the thumbnail photo. And uh, that video just took off at that point. It had been up for a couple of years. And all of a sudden, I'm getting just, just thousands and thousands of people watching this video. So um, that video now has like 1.4 million views. And uh, a, a lot of the people hate me for the video because I threw rocks into the water. Um, I, I deleted the worst comments, but if you go there and read the comments, there are people just furious about me throwing rocks into the water because um, they thought I was hiding them from people or they thought that it, 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 they said they, they'd say things like, it took thousands of years for that rock to be on the beach and now you've thrown it back in. So I guess they don't understand waves. But um, anyhow, that video has just really taken off. So now I put out two videos a week. For a while, I was doing one video a week. Um, but I do the little rocks in a box videos now. So um, I now have 19,000 subscribers. Um, I've made about $5,000 uh, from YouTube. Uh, and, and if you figure out how many hours I put into it, um, that's well below minimum wage. Um, so it sounds like a lot until you realize that that's like all I do anymore, it seems like. But I'm having fun doing it. Um, it's kind of fun reading the comments. Since that one video, almost all the comments are very nice. Uh, so it's fun to see people get excited about seeing rocks and stuff. So um, there's conversations back and forth. Uh, so anyhow, that's been, uh, been my little venture for the last, it's only been about a year. Uh, I think I started in February last year. Um, doing the, the Petoskey stone and then it takes a little while you have to have 4,000 hours of viewing in the past year and you have to have a thousand subscribers uh, to be able to make money and uh, so it took me in from February to April to get to that point mainly from that video of me picking up rocks on the beach and then uh, I don't know now I'm making about 500 bucks a month um, doing it so all the money goes back into cameras and um, I just bought a drone, uh, it, these lights that I have, uh, behind here, those aren't super cheap. I mean, those were cheap ones, but you can, uh, they're still not super cheap. <laughs> so all stuff trying to make my videos better. Uh, so that's been kind of fun. And that's Rob, quite an adventure trying to put those together. Go ahead, Bill. Rob, uh, this is Bill again. Do you, uh, exhibit some of your products with the local, uh, Vestry Museum and also in the uh, a few of the uh, jewelry shops here in Alpena. Um, I have I sell Toski stones like uh, these. These are a box of Toski stones that are, will go for sale. Um, the the local basket case is my best place for selling um, those. Uh, I have I'm trying to turn my camera around. Uh, I have some uh, the crosses and guitar picks at Olivet, uh, the, the Christian bookstore by the old movie theater that's closed. Um, the museum uh, does have some of my rocks uh, for sale. They actually asked me to make little bags. They had these little like mystery bags or something of rocks. Um, they sell for uh, just a few bucks. Um, so their supplier for those started charging them too much. So they asked me if I'd make them for their old price. So, um, I haven't actually done that yet because I'm waiting to get some rocks from, I want to get some specular hematite from up in the UP. Um, there's an old mine you can go to and there's this hematite that's all sparkly. Um, so I want to, that'd be a cheap, easy thing to get to put in there. Um, but they, they bought some of my, uh, Pudding stones and Toski stones. Um, I, pudding stones are harder to find and take a lot longer to tumble. So I don't sell as many as out of those. Um, I think that's about it. I, I took some to the, uh, uh, the NOAA shipwreck museum uh, a couple of years ago and they were very excited to get them and I left them my number and stuff and then I uh, went back in there and they were buying them from someplace up in the UP again. So I don't know why they never contacted me back, but I figured I wouldn't pester them and ask them again. So. Uh, so they're, they're for sale in a few places. Uh, I don't have anything on display in the museum, uh, but in their gift shop I have, uh, they have some of my Toski stones and maybe a couple pudding stones. I can't remember what they've got right now. Okay, thanks very much, Ron. Great, anybody else have questions? 
Well, Rob, appreciate this uh, opportunity to see your workshop and all the different equipment. It's certainly, uh, I know I've looked kind of at doing that since I, I can collect lots of uh, Petoskey stones down here at Hubbard Lake. But uh, I've, I've polished a few, but I can see how uh, with all that equipment, you certainly can uh, speed up the process. Yep, there's, there's quicker ways than hand polishing, but that's <laughs> the cheap and easy way to do it. Somebody that just wants to do one or two, that's definitely the way to go. And they can get just as shiny as hand polishing. Great. Anybody have any questions for Rob before we end? Uh, thank you very much, Rob. Appreciate your taking your time to prep and so forth. And I'm sure you have lots of uh, additional uh, YouTube viewers after this uh, presentation. <laughs> Thanks. So I'll end the meeting unless there's any further questions. Great. Yes, thank you. Yes, Oops. yeah, Rob. Rob, one quick one. What What do you use as a sealer to polish the stone once you do one by hand? By hand, what do you put on it to, to seal it? Nothing. So it'll Good. always shine. Yeah, it's just really, really smooth. There's none of my rocks have anything. Well, there was that um, um, chain coral that I put polyurethane on the bottom as a base for, but um, none of these have any kind of coating on them at all. They're just, okay. they're just you, you just use finer and finer and finer sandpaper or grit or whatever you're using until the scratches get smaller and smaller. And smaller. So yeah, there's there's nothing on them. Okay. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Bottom. I just don't. Okay. Are we any anybody else? Great. Thanks again, Rob. Sure. And uh, hopefully you can come to our. We have, we, we, actually, we have some uh, award ceremonies for presenters, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to attend okay. sometime in the future. Thank you very much. We're going to end, end the presentation. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.